Thank you, my friends. Uh, so great to see the room full here, and hello to our Zoom audience as well. Bach and the pursuit of musical perfection. Now that is a lofty title. <laughs> what does it mean to pursue musical perfection? And how can one possibly assert that this was the goal of a composer who was born, my friends, March 21st, 1685? He lived a long time ago. We don't know nearly as much about Bach as we'd like to. We know far more, for example, about Mozart, who was born in 1756, same year as Alexander Hamilton. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody asks, you can tell them it's G5. Next <laughs> <laughs> time you're in a ring talk, what do we know that it's G5? <laughs> we don't know much about Bach because he didn't leave much for us. There's no breadcrumb trail. The way that Mozart left us a huge repository of letters, most of them, for example, addressed to his father or to his sister or to his cousin. Bach left no such treasure trove. His treasure trove, instead, is almost exclusively concentrated in the remarkable catalog, which is known by the three letters B W V. See it there on the screen. B W V stands for Bach Werke Verzeichnis, the Bach Works Catalog, the catalog, the definitive catalog of J S Bach's music that was created in the 19th century. That is, the catalog was put together in the 19th century by a musicologist who decided to organize these works, not chronologically, but rather instead by genre. Therefore, cantata number one, which is a cantata called Wie schön leuchtet der Morgenstern, How Beautifully Shines the Morning Star, uh, was written, Gesundheit, <laughs> when Bach was close to 50 years old. So it's not a chronological catalog. It's instead arranged by genre. Anyway, you slice it, it's an impressive catalog, not only for the quality of the music, but of course, as we'll talk about in a minute, has served as a template for study, not only for aspiring composers and music theorists and practitioners of four-part writing and harmony exploration, but also by performers, including singers, violinists, keyboardists, certainly, uh, and just about most of the conventional instruments or their immediate antecedents that you can think of. So it's a massive catalog with well over a thousand works. Simply put, Bach was incredibly prolific. And if one were to be so ambitious as to try to study Bach's entire catalog, my friends, one lifetime would not be long enough to do it. There are musicologists such as my uh, amazing dissertation advisor, Eric Chafe, who has devoted his life to studying Bach. And I remember when I was writing my dissertation, I would say, well, you know, in the alto recitative in Cantata 63, and he would look at me and say, well, which one is that again? <laughs> because it's simply impossible to, to commit all of this to memory. It's just, a, a, as I mentioned, it's a treasure trove. Um, and what that means is that there, there are no sort of throwaway pieces where you say, well, I'll skip that one. No, if one truly wants to appreciate Bach, we want to appreciate all of Bach. Now, we're not going to be able to do that tonight. What we're instead going to do is look at two works from two particular parts of Bach's career. First, a collection of works from 1721, a collection of six concertos, or if you want to be fancy and impress your friends and neighbors, you can say concerti. Much fancier than concertos. Of course, it's Italian, so concerti would be the plural. We're going to look at the vaunted Brandenburg Concerti. That's a title that I think most people will say, oh yes, I've heard of that. Or perhaps even you can hum a melody or a tune from one of the Brandenburg Concerti. We'll go a little bit in depth today. We'll dive under the hood, as they say, and look at the story of the Brandenburg Concerti, and also talk about some of the musical characteristics that typify these works. And then we'll talk about a remarkable, but really esoteric collection of works Bach composed at the very end of his life, known as the Musikalische Opfer, the musical offering. Now that one is a far more arcane collection of works, less well known than the Brandenburg Concerti, certainly, but if we're going to be talking about Bach's pursuit of musical perfection, well, it stands to reason we should look at something that he wrote at the end of his life, which serves as something of a will and testament with respect to his convictions as far as music goes. <laughs> 
Bach, as some of you may know, ended his compositional process. When he was finished with the piece, he would write at the bottom of the manuscript three letters, S, D, G, Latin for soli, Deo, Gloria, for the glory of God alone. That is to say, no matter what he was writing, Bach thought of himself as a conduit. Some elemental energy possessed him, but it wasn't his own gift. It was something given to him von oben herabgegeben, given to him from above, as he would have said. And therefore, what he was doing was kind of an extension of something coming from a higher place, from a higher power. Bach meditated quite a bit on issues which to most people today don't, don't cross our minds very often. For example, Bach was deeply immersed in eschatological meditation. Eschatology, of course, deals with that which anticipates the kingdom of heaven, the afterlife. Now, if I ask my students, who range in age from approximately 18 to 22, do you think about matters of eschatology? The answer would probably be a chuckle, a guffaw, a slapping of the knee. They don't think about it very often, but Bach thought about this even for a very young age. Later this semester, our amazing, uh, there's a cheap plug here, but the amazing choir of CT State Naugatuck Valley under my direction, I guess. <laughs> cheap plug and a little bit of a self high five here, but featuring Mr. Marty Hirsch, who's over here in the end of the gallery. Um, we'll be singing Bach's Cantata 106, Gottes Zeit ist die allerbeste Zeit, a cantata that was written probably in 1706 or 07, when Bach was a very young man, and the title of that work translates to God's time is the very best time. In other words, when God calls you to be with him, i.e., when you die, in you sterben wir zu recht in sight, in him we die at the appointed time. Bach lived in a time when life was very fragile and suffering was widespread. So is it a surprise that he meditated so often on matters of eschatology? Well, perhaps not. We're going to start, I want to just play a little bit from the keyboard before we get into the Brandenburg Concerti. And I want to talk about complexity in Bach's music because it is very much a part of Bach's musical language. Simply put, and you might say, well, is this a subjective opinion? or is this an objective empirical fact? I would say that what I'm about to tell you is close to an objective fact, in as much as these things are possible to establish in music. Bach's music is difficult. More difficult, I would say, certainly than Mozart, and we're gonna study Mozart in April, but anyone who's ever played Mozart's sonatas, for example, 19 brilliant sonatas, if you play them at the keyboard and then compare them to one of Bach's for example, French suites or English suites or the Italian concerto or even a pair of preludes and fugues from the well-tempered clavier, you would say that, well, Mozart is just a little bit easier. And that has to do with a concept called texture. Bach's music almost exclusively conforms to a textural element that we call polyphony, polyphonic, many sounds. Let me give you an example of how that works. In Mozart, what we often get are simple melodies, often triadic in nature, accompanied by simple chordal harmony. You might as well play it like this if you were to take out the rhythmic element of the left hand. There's really no difference other than that in the first example, I've added rhythm to the left hand. This texture is called homophonic texture. What it means is that the left hand is basically playing along. It is supporting the right hand. There is no main disparity in independence. The right hand is carrying the melody, and the left hand is playing the harmony. Melody plus harmony, you get a homophonic texture. Now, you do get homophonic textures in Bach. For example, in his 371 harmonized chorales. <laughs> but what you more often are going to see is a polyphonic texture. A polyphonic texture is one where the voices, here voices can apply to the voices, for example, that the hands are articulating in keyboard repertoire, are going to be playing totally different lines with different directionality, that is to say different contour, different directions, what we might call parallel motion or contrary motion, and altogether different identities. Doesn't have that quality in the Mozart where the left hand is basically playing second fiddle, if you will, to the right hand. We see this all over Mozart. 
again, it's not doing anything noteworthy there, it's just playing harmony. It's sort of the same rhythm, you see, even though it is harm it's rhythmicized in eighth notes, but it's just block chords. <clears throat> what we're instead going to get in Bach is a lot of independence. You can hear that in this example I'm going to play here. This is from the Partita in C minor. And I've got my fancy uh, page flipper here, so if you see my left foot not clacking, that's what I'm doing. All right, here we go. Listen to the independence between the right and left hands here. Could you hear the difference in contour and identity there? There is also often an element of imitation in Bach's music. This corresponds to what I just mentioned, the idea of a fugue. I'll just give you a few bars here. Thank you. 
Bachman with more complex fugues, as we'll see this evening, going all the way up to six independent voices. But that's a story for later in the program. All right, so let's talk about the pursuit of musical perfection. As I said, a lofty title. But we know that Bach thought of music as more than just a profession. It wasn't just his job or his hobby. This was his way of serving God. And music, for him, was intertwined. Even when it was instrumental music, it was intertwined with the idea of devotion and serving the Almighty. For example, Bach wrote over 200 uh, sacred cantatas, church cantatas. He didn't use that term. He would have called them Kirchenstücke, church pieces. Talk about uh, underselling the product. <laughs> Church pieces, well, you know, it could be anything. But these are very substantial pieces. They range in length from 20 to 45 minutes. They're written for wildly different ensemble setups, almost always with SATB voices, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, with soloists. But how many soloists and what type of solos and what type of obligato or soloist instruments he would write for in the consort, in the small ensembles that accompany these pieces, they totally vary. But one thing that they have in common is that they are meant to intensify devotion, to bring the parishioner closer to heaven in whatever way. And they were often written to where the text was meant to take from the gospel and epistle readings of that particular Sunday so that, again, parishioners who would go and hear the sermon, for example, right after the sermon or the predict in German, they would hear the music. And it was meant to go together. The intertwining of the two meant to amplify the teachings of whatever they were supposed to be reading that Sunday. Perfection for Bach meant <laughs> adhering to the principles of composition that he held so dear, namely the polyphonic mastery that we talked about and that I just demonstrated, only a scintilla, a fraction of a fraction of, at the keyboard. What I will say about it that's more interesting for us is that Bach's music by the 1720s and certainly by the 1730s was going out of fashion. Europe was changing. The so-called Aufklärung, the Enlightenment, had taken foot. The Freemasons, the Illuminati, their meritocratic view of society and their mm -hmm. yearning for a music that was a simpler, more accessible kind of music that anyone could appreciate. Not just the high and mighty who had trained ears, but anybody could appreciate this music. That had taken foot. And so Bach's music was lacking in popular appeal. At the time, in the 1720s, he had moved to a town called Leipzig. Now Leipzig is a big city. Um, and at the time Bach was living there, it had a population of about 3,500. And Bach was living in Leipzig, and he was teaching and composing and doing all these things. But um, for him, there was no question about what kind of music he was going to write. And so, for example, when he was lambasted by an academician and a critic by the name of Johann Adolf Scheibe, Scheibe said, you know, Bach's music is very good. I had a chance. I visited Leipzig. Herr Bach, he writes good stuff. <laughs> but, but, aber, however, the adversative conjunction that we all hate to hear. <laughs> it was great, but what does Scheibe say? He says, Herr Bach can't get out of his own way. He complicates his music with all this needless counterpoint, all this polyphony, and he ruins it. Bach's response to the critic was to slam his foot on the gas pedal as far as poly polyphonic music goes. And so some of the last pieces that Bach composed, let's just take music from the 1740s, the B minor mass, which, which opens with a tour de force, five-voice fugue, massive fugue based on a huge cycle of fifths progression with chromatic harmony, a bugbear to sing for anybody who's ever tried to sing the B minor mass. The opening Kyrie is a, a real stab at the check. The Goldberg variations, which contain not six or eight or 12 variations, but 30 variations, plus a, a quadruped, which is sort of a, a folkish dance at the end. Bach was being rather cheeky. And then finally, the capstone pieces of his life and his career, 
a work that was left unfinished at the time of his death, known as Die Kunst der Fuge. That's the genitive case for all you German language fanatics. <laughs> Die Kunst, the art, der Fuge, of the fugue. And then finally, a work we're going to end with, Die Musikalische Opfer. What did Bach think of his critics? What did he think of their commentary, of their railing against his preference for polyphonic textures, what he perceived to be the pursuit of musical perfection? Bach says, you can have your light, airy music, what would eventually become music of the so-called Rococo period or the pre-enlightenment, uh, pre-classical style. That would be music of composers that are a footnote in history, names like Stamitz and Wagenseil and Sammartini, who, believe it or not, was not Italian. San Martini was French. <laughs> San Martin was the, the name. Anyway, I want to rewind it for us and take us back to 1721. Bach at the time was wrapping up his tenure as the court composer in an area called Anhalt Kürten. Kürten spelled in German K O Umlaut. You love those umlauts. T H E N. And he was working there and writing mostly instrumental music. And the reason for that was because Curtin, where he worked for six years, 1717 to 23, was a Calvinist town. Now, for Bach, who was a pietist Lutheran, he would never have gone to work in a Catholic town. Sorry, Catholics, but Bach was not. He, was, he lived in a certain time and a place where that simply wasn't in the cards. But Calvinism was close enough. For those of you who remember, John Calvin was an important Swiss theologian who was alive around the time of Martin Luther. He was a bit younger, and he wrote a very important treatise in 1535, The Principles of Christianity. Um, and Calvin was in agreement with Luther on many of his ideas. So that would have made Bach more comfortable working there, especially if the salary was attractive, which guess what? It was. And Bach had a growing brood, so off to Curtin he went in 1717, writing instrumental music. And in 1721, he writes, what has to be considered some of the most impressive works he wrote during his entire tenure in Curtin, and maybe even during his whole life, the Brandenburg Concerti, written for a guy named Christian Ludwig, who held the title Margrave of Brandenburg, Brandenburg which more or less corresponds to modern-day Berlin, Potsdam, that area. The Margrave of Brandenburg was a music lover. He was also a relation of Frederick the Great. Keep him in mind, because we're going to get to him in about 15 minutes. Bach! <laughs> never met the Margrave of Brandenburg, but he knew that he was a powerful man who had a music-loving court, and he thought, as many composers did, that if he wrote some music and dedicated it to this wealthy patron, perhaps he might receive some kind of stipend or honorarium as a thank you. What does it matter if you were a very rich and wealthy aristocrat? You could afford to shower your largesse, to be magnanimous with a composer who showed superlative skill and essentially immortalizes you with their music. That was Bach's objective in writing the Brandenburg Concerti. He writes six concerti for this powerful, music-loving aristocrat, and hopefully, in return, receives some geld, some money. He wrote six concerti, and they're remarkable pieces. One of the reasons they're so remarkable is because each one is very different from the next. A concerto, fundamentally, is about opposition. That is actually what the root of the word concerto comes from. It comes from a Latin word, concertare, which means to struggle against something, to oppose. And in a concerto, which is a product of, that was birthed in the Baroque period, just like opera and oratorio, the Baroque period is a very important period in music history. In the Baroque period, the concerto was initially bound up with something which will seem a little bit esoteric, but perhaps familiar. It was bound up with the idea of the concerto grosso where instead of having one soloist striving against the orchestra, you might have many soloists, multiple soloists, and that's the, the template for the Brandenburg Concerti. So for example, in the first Brandenburg Concerto in F major, we get two horn soloists and a, a, a kind of violin which plays a third higher, it's tuned higher. They call it scordatura violin. Then in Brandenburg II, you have four soloists, and the soloists are, drum roll please, Violin, okay, that makes sense. Violin is the workhorse instrument. It's going to be present in most ensembles. And certainly, if you're going to write soloistic, virtuoso music, the violin is a great instrument to tap into. But also oboe. Well, Bach loved the oboe, so that makes sense. Okay. A rotary piccolo trumpet, which we'll see in a moment. 
and an alto recorder. <laughs> Those are the four solo instruments. Brandenburg three is all strings. Brandenburg four calls for two recorder soloists and once again a violin. Brandenburg five calls for once again violin, flauto traverso, which is the transverse flutes. That's sort of like the flute that we all would recognize, except instead of being made out of silver or metal, it's made out of wood. Traverso here means transverse, that is held perpendicular to the body. And then finally, Brandenburg VI calls for, wait a second, viola da gamba, this esoteric and antiquated instrument of the Renaissance. Bach wrote a concerto that features viola da gamba solo. Yes, indeed. We're going to look at Brandenburg concerto number two. This is the Netherlands Bach Society. We have time to play the first movement. Um, I would ask that you listen um, for a couple of things as we dive into this. Number one, the way that the soloists take turns articulating elements of the main themes. Number two, the pervasive and omnipresent harpsichord, which plays here not as a soloist, but rather as part of the basso continuo. For those of you who like jazz, I know we have some jazz fans here. That's your rhythm section. Mm -hmm. Your rhythm section in the Baroque period, which is <clears throat> present in almost every style of music, and it includes two forces, essentially. One, some instrument that can play chords, like a harpsichord, and then some instrument that can play a bass line. For example, a double bass, or a cello, or perhaps a violone, or maybe it's a theorbo. Could be any number of instruments, some of which are familiar, some of which would probably make us scratch our chin a little bit, uh, or at least raise our eyebrows. So you'll listen for the harpsichord, which is just trucking along here. It's not until Brandenburg V that Bach writes for the harpsichord in soloistic fashion. So that's a really big watershed moment for the harpsichord. Up until then, it had really been thought of as an accompanimental instrument. You're also going to be listening for the disparity in the modern B-flat trumpet, which has valves and can play chromatically, and the trumpet that Bach writes for here, which is a natural trumpet of the Baroque period. These are really difficult instruments to play. To find a professional who can play a Baroque trumpet, you're looking for someone who's got a very peculiar and odd educational background. <laughs> Odds are they started out playing music as a child, kept playing probably in their high school and college bands, and then sometime in college fell in love with Baroque music and decided to go for a graduate degree in period instrumentation. And then either they had really nice parents who underwrote the expense <laughs> or otherwise came across a period instrument, that is to say a recreation of a 17th or 18th century instrument, which they then have to retrain themselves to play because it's so different from the modern analog they're used to. So as we listen to the Netherlands Bach Society or any other number of wonderful Baroque ensembles that are active today, let's just appreciate that we're living in an era where period instrumentation is the norm, not the exception. If you go back and listen to Bach recordings from the 70s, for example, listen to Carl Richter and the Münchner Bach Orchester. I actually rather like some of those recordings. I love Richter's recording of the St. Matthew Passion, all three hours and 40 minutes of it. His <laughs> tempi are so slow. Um, but those are anachronistic. They probably don't sound like what Bach would have put together 300 years ago. This is a lot closer to the mark. Let's listen to it. <laughs> 
become familiar with is the sort of the form that is more at home in Mozart's era, the solo concerto, as it's called. Mozart was a prolific composer of concerti, having written 27 piano concerti, five violin concerti, and even a clarinet concerto. And there are others. There's a flute and harp concerto, K310, and, and many more. Uh, the format shifts in the classical period, and it really casts more of a proverbial spotlight on the soloist, as opposed to the soloists plural of the Baroque period. I think one thing we might take away as we listen to this is just how busy the music is. This non-stop stream of essentially 16th notes written in a bright tempo. That gives the Baroque sound its motoric quality, but also for us listeners gives us a significant challenge. There's so much going on. We have four different soloists, the timbres are all strikingly different between the soloists. The sound colors, if you will, what the Germans call Klangfarbe, is so different from one soloist to the next. And you have that metallic tinkling sound of the harpsichord. You have the strings, including, by the way, it was very nice at the beginning of this video, as some of the soloists are taking their turn at the tune, you actually get to hear some of the contrapuntal writing in the cello. It's one of the things I love about the Netherlands Bach Society, their cinematography, if you will, is not always obvious. The old thing to do would have been just shoot the soloist. What they'll do often is they'll shoot the contrapuntal lines that are played against the soloist, and that gives us something to help us appreciate the complexity of this music. I've got some other visual aids to help us appreciate the complexity of Bach's music. But before we move on, I want to wrap up our story with Christian Ludwig, Margrave of Brandenburg. So the story goes that he gets these six concerti wrapped up with a beautiful inscription. Actually, the dedication letter, as we can read it today, you can read it, it's on Wikipedia. It's kind of nauseating to read. <laughs> because it's Bach being just this side of self-deprecating. Oh, your majesty should not judge these imperfect works with your, your grace's divine ears. And your ears are so superior to my own that I, your humble servant, submit these to you with great humility. Oh, it's very clear that Bach is writing in the style that a subject would have written into an aristocratic figure, a powerful, land-owning figure who had the power to shape his own fortunes. It's clear that Bach is writing in this obsequious manner. But what you'll understand if you read letters of this sort from that period is that they all read this way. This was just a convention of the time. And by the way, it's a convention that stuck around well into the Enlightenment. Um, you know, the, if you were an Illuminatus or a hardcore Freemason, you might, have, you might have chafed at it. But if you wanted something from somebody who could have helped you, you still would have conformed. That's the basic rule. So Christian Ludwig gets these six works wrapped up with this beautiful dedication page, praising him to the sky. And he says to his chamberlain, well, great. What do you think? Send these, uh, send these off. Let's see how they sound. And his court composer comes back, a guy by the name of Samuel Dreze, comes back and he says, your grace, these pieces are not fit for playing. <laughs> Why not? Oh, they're, they're too difficult. Herr Bach has clearly written them in a way to uh, thumb his nose at us, and, and uh, they, they, don't, uh, they don't conform to the instrumentation that we have at hand, and basically it was a bunch of excuses. Now, he was right, and of course he was wrong. He was right that these were extraordinarily difficult pieces for the period. They were. But he was also right that Bach had musicians on hand in Curtin that were capable of playing this. That's one of the reasons he chose to go work in Curtin in 1717. But he was also clearly not in the mood to spend all the time that it would have been necessary to prepare his musicians to play these works. The rule of thumb in the Baroque period and well past the Baroque period is composers almost never played music by other composers. They might have studied it by candlelight. They might have absorbed or even borrowed and lifted ideas. Handel was notorious for lifting ideas. But there was no reason to promote another composer's work. There was nothing in it for you. <laughs> um, and that, that convention sticks around really in past the life of Beethoven. It's really Franz Liszt who upends that tradition. After Beethoven died, Liszt just goes around playing these recitals. And the cornerstone part of his literature that he, he performed was Beethoven. So playing composers other than one's 
being music by composers other than oneself is not the convention of the Baroque period. So it's no surprise that Bach's Brandenburg Concerti, Concerti were not played in Berlin, essentially, in the court of Brandenburg. Um, what's really crazy to think about is that these works were put on a shelf and remained there until 1849. That's almost 130 years. And Bach didn't receive one pfennig, one devotion, nothing. He didn't get anything for writing these. A stark contrast to, for example, writing the Goldberg Variation, the Goldberg Variations, written about 20 years after this, which netted Bach a huge goblet filled with Louis d'Or, huge golden coins that was equivalent to about a year's salary that he got for writing this collection. That's a story for another day. If you want to know about the, brand, the uh, Goldberg Variations, it's a totally bizarre, utterly weird story. Uh, I'll give it to you in a nutshell. He wrote the music for a guy by the name of Count Kaiserling, who was an insomniac. And Kaiserling had asked his court musician, a guy by the name of Johannes Gottlieb Goldberg, to write music that he could play for him so that he could fall asleep. And Goldberg went back to his teacher, Bach, and um, the rest is history. But basically, Bach was writing music that he was hoping would put his listener to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about the Brandenburg Concerti before we move on to the Music Kind of Show? Yeah. Okay, they're wonderful works. If you want to listen to them, there are any number of great performances on YouTube. Uh, going back 20 years, really, when it comes to period authentic performances, you can see, for example, the um, Freiburg Baroque Orchestra, mm -hmm. a great group. Uh, and they actually perform, they recorded in the Spiegelsaal, the Hall of Mirrors, where Bach was working while he was in Kirchen. So those are cool videos to watch. They're a little dated now. Uh, as far as authenticity goes, some of the instruments are period authentic and some of them you'll see like modern violins, which basically are the same. You'll notice the violins of the Baroque period, they would be indistinguishable to all but the keenest eyes who really know string instruments. But you can tell by the bows. The bows are the obvious way to tell. A Baroque bow is much shorter with a much more pronounced curvature to it. All right, let's talk about the musicalische Opfer, the musical offering. What a strange title for a piece, right? Well, in 1747, Bach received a summons, not an invitation, a summons. Who summoned him? Well, it was none other than Frederick the Great. Frederick, that Frederick the Great? <laughs> that Frederick the Great. You know, people who study German history, unfortunately, when we think of the term Third Reich, that conjures up nightmares, that period from January of 1933 to really the end of April, April 30th, 1945. But very few people ask, well, what came before the Third Reich? What were the other Reichs, the other empires? Well, the second one was Bismarck and the Vereinigung, the unification of Germany in 1871. But the very first Reich was Frederick the Great, who was considered one of the most powerful rulers in all of Europe during his own lifetime, which more or less corresponds to the first, uh, or let's say the middle of the 18th century. Frederick was younger than Bach by a generation, and it showed. How did it show? Well, Frederick was a Francophile. He loved all things French. He loved all things new as well. He collected what were emerging as sort of new machines, and contraptions, wind-up toys, and things like that, which he collected and showed off, and considered to be part of his prized possessions. One of the new fangled gadgets and gizmos that he collected was a particular instrument invented around 1700 by a guy named Bartolomeo Cristofore. Pianos. Frederick the Great collected pianos, and he kept them in his summer palace at Sassuisi, which is in, in Potsdam. It was built to look like Versailles because he was such a Francophile. Frederick bragged about how he had never read a book in German in his whole life. <laughs> He's the king of Prussia, by the way. <laughs> never read a book. Frederick, who called himself Frédéric, could not have been more different than Bach in his musical tastes. While Bach preferred counterpoint and polyphony and the complexity we've been discussing, Frederick instead preferred the new sounds of what would eventually be called Rococo music or pre-classical music kind of music that I was playing earlier, which reached its full maturation with Mozart, but in the early days was very sort of simplistic music, 
based around the idea of simple triadic melodies, almost always written in major keys, and simple block harmonies in the left hand of the keyboard, for example, which can be rhythmicized in what we call an Alberti bass line, named after a one-hit wonder by the name of Domenico Alberti, who was part of this pre-classical Rococo movement. <laughs> Frederick loved it. He loved this style. Now, among the many musicians that Frederick employed was a guy by the name of Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. Not the eldest, but the second of Bach's sons and his massive brood. Carl Philip, or as he's known, CPE Bach, was working at the court of Frederick the Great. He was criminally underpaid during his tenure there, possibly because Frederick had a certain degree of antipathy towards him. Why? He was a Bach, after all. Frederick didn't like those Bachs. <laughs> too German, too Lutheran, to be sure. Frederick himself was, in his personal life, an atheist. On a state level, he had to at least maintain the patina, the facade of being a practicing Christian. He was no such thing. Bach was a family man. He had been married twice. 20 children sired from the loins of J.S. Bach. Frederick died with no issue. Frederick was almost certainly a gay man. He would not have been the first gay ruler in Europe, certainly. But that, his atheism, his lack of family, stand, for better or worse, in diametric contrast to J.S. Bach. Not a value judgment, but an empirical assessment. <laughs> but it's music where perhaps they disagreed most vehemently. Now you would say, well, what do you mean they disagreed? These are two guys from two different generations, two different walks of life, to borrow an anachronistic phrase. Why would they have anything to do with each other? Certainly Frederick would have known who Bach was, and Bach would have known who Frederick was. <laughs> but how could their paths have crossed? Well, remember. Frederick employed Bach's son. And so it came to pass that in 1747, three years before Bach died, Bach was summoned to Potsdam. Not a short journey. Not a simple trip for a 62-year-old, back then that was ancient, to make on bumpy, rutted roads a carriage ride that would have lasted a few days. Bach makes his way to Potsdam arrives at saint suisi at the summer palace of Frederick. And before he can wipe the dust of travel from his powdered wig, <laughs> he's summoned. Okay. And Bach heads up to the palace. Greetings, Herr Bach, Frederick says. <coughs> I'd like to show you something. Sehr gut. Ihre Hohenheit, your highness, your excellency. Let's take a look. What was it? Frederick wanted to show him his pianos. Bach must have been thinking, did you bring me all the way here to show me your pianos? Mm -hmm. Bach knew about pianos. They were around. They wouldn't really catch much momentum until the 1770s and 1780s with certain maker, piano makers like uh, Erard, Broadwood in England. There were, there were piano makers that were going to put the instruments on the map, and more importantly, composers like Mozart who had put the, the instrument on the map. But in 1747, the piano was not on the map. It was a, a curiosity. They were expensive. They went out of tune very quickly. They had very tinny and metallic timbres uh, that were considered unpleasant to the ear. And you might say, well, what about the harpsichord? Remember, people have been living with a harpsichord for centuries. That was what they wanted. That's what they were used to. So Bach is paraded around the palace. And at every piano, he's forced to stop. Spiel etwas für uns. Play something for us. <laughs> Bach would begin to improvise. And after a minute or so, genug, enough, <laughs> next. And he went from room to room, playing on no fewer than 19 pianos, before Frederick had not just Bach, but the entire assembled party, which included some of the most prolific and important composers in North Germany at the time. Again, these names would be a footnote in history, but if you really know Baroque music, Reinhard Kaiser, Christoph Graupner, the Wendler brothers, all in attendance. And Bach must have been thinking, well, I know these composers. Why is he only asking me to play? They return to the Great Hall. 
piano's there. Frederick, who was a flautist, produced his flute and said, Herr Bach, I wonder if you might be able to play one of your fugues on this theme. The theme sounds like this. particular melody is one that would have had the hairs of all the composers in the room standing on end. Why? Because as the tune progressed, they would have heard the inimitable sound of the chromatic scale. Now there's a problem with chromatic scales, which is that harmonizing them with Baroque harmony is tricky. It can be done. But setting it to an imitative polyphonic pattern which is what a fugue is. That's just not, not just tricky. That's darn near impossible. Working it out at one's desk with ample time, maybe. But to improvise a fugue on the spot? I don't think so. At least that was Frederick's plan. Musicologists believe that Frederick almost certainly wished to humiliate Bach by presenting him with a fugue subject which was sort of anatomically built to be like some mutant bacterial strain. <laughs> In the way that a mutated bacterial strain is resistant to antibiotics, this fugue subject was resistant to fugal setting. It's too chromatic. Bach, like everyone else, must have stood there in the hall listening as Frederick played the Tema Regia, the royal theme, as it later became called. And we can almost imagine the cog spinning. The other composers in the room are probably drawing in their breath and shaking their heads in disbelief. Bach, after Frederick completed his playing of the short subject, he said, Herr Bach, I wonder if you could play us a fugue on this theme. We can almost imagine the smug smirk of self-satisfaction on Frederick's face. Bach walked over, sat down, and improvised a perfect three-part fugue on the spot, on the Tema Regia, the royal subject. Frederick is said to have responded with a smile that did not touch his eyes. <laughs> he later, after Bach finished playing, said, that's very nice, Herr Bach, but that was only a three-voice fugue. I meant for you to play a six-voice fugue. <laughs> Now, Bach had never written a six-voice fugue in his life. There, if you study harmony and counterpoint, one of the problems you run into is that as you add subsequent voices, you run into what are called voice-leading issues, doubled notes which are not supposed to be doubled, parallel notes which are not supposed to move in parallel, octaves and fifths and the like, leading tones of which you can only have one, sevenths of which you can only have one, sevenths that must resolve down that for whatever reason, have to resolve up. Sit, uh, let's say, uh, uh, leading tones that are supposed to resolve up, but somehow, for whatever reason, have to resolve down. You're not supposed to do these things, so Bach had not written any six-voice fugues. He'd only written one five-voice fugue in the entire well-tempered clavier, which is a kind of compendium of fugue writing. It's the C-sharp minor from book one. It's the only five-voice fugue he had written there. So he says to the king, Your Grace, I need some time. <laughs> in his car carriage ride back to Leipzig, he had already started writing. Eventually, he presented to the king a collection, not just a six-voice fugue, which he calls a richer car, more on that in a minute, but ten canons and a handful of trio sonatas. Let me talk about that very briefly. The canons, there are ten of them. The trio sonatas, those are works written for a combination of instruments, in this case, including solo flute. And finally, the richer card. The collection is known as the musical offering, or in German, das musikalische Opfer. A couple of things here. In his dedication letter, Bach does not say, I dedicate these works to his grace the king. He says, ich weihe diese Werke. 
by him, I consecrate these works to the king. Why does he choose that word? Why, furthermore, does he choose the word opfer, which does mean offering, but is more often used in German to mean sacrifice. Why does he write ten canons? Canon, of course, is synonymous with the law. And the number ten is synonymous with the ten commandments. Bach was clearly sending a message to the atheist king. <laughs> you serve your own pleasures. I serve a higher power. Soli Deo Gloria. Let's look at one of the canons from this collection. This is the Endlessly Rising canon. What Bach wrote in the... Getting great internet. Here is he writes a very funny thing in the inscription. He writes, As the music rises, so too shall the glory of the king rise. But if you listen to what happens here, you'll notice there's something odd going on. <laughs> descending chromatic line, which is the most defining feature of the Tema Regia. Bach writes this fugue, and if you look at the score closely, what you'll notice is it's constantly changing key. It starts in C minor, then to D minor, then to E minor, F sharp minor, G sharp minor, B flat minor, before ending in C minor. This is what we call a perpetually ascending canon. It rises on each iteration of the theme up a whole step in successive minor keys. The interesting thing about that is that it starts in C minor and it ends right back in C minor. And yet Bach wrote in the inscription, as the canon ascends, so too shall the glory of the king. But the thing is, the canon ends exactly where it began. It doesn't really rise at all. It ends exactly where it starts. Bach goes further. The capstone part of the collection of the musical offering is the six-part Richard which we'll listen to in a moment. It's a sort of curiosity. It may not be the most compelling thing in the world to listen to, but it's based on this utterly bizarre theme, which, as we said, is resistant to fugal treatment. One last note about the musical offering before we get to the Richard and that is that Bach wrote a trio sonata for a flute soloist. The obvious interpretation would be that he's trying to flatter the king by writing for the instrument upon which the king was proficient and therefore the king could be a sort of obligato soloist for this particular trio sonata. The thing is Bach wrote it, the flute part to be deliberately too hard for the king to play. <laughs> Finally we get to the Richikar. Bach chooses the term Richikar here and not fugue and that's interesting. The term Richikar, which is spelled like rice car, one word, is the antecedent to the fugue. It's even older. It goes back to the early Renaissance. You can find this, for example, in the keyboard works of Jan Petersen Svelink. Never heard of Svelink? Check him out. Jan Petersen Svelink, great Dutch composer of the mid-Baroque, early Baroque, really. Svelink's music is something that Bach would have known, just as Bach would have known the music of Dietrich Buxtehude. <laughs> is that a real name? Yeah, well, you bet it's a real name. Buxtehude. Check him out. Go to YouTube. Look up Dietrich Buxtehude and Jan Peters und Svelink. What Bach is doing here is he's drawing on a history of rich music which was written in this tradition of what's called the North German School. A school of music which had deep roots 
went all the way back to the Reformation era itself. Take that, atheist king. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being an atheist, by the way. No value judgments, but that's how Bach would have looked at it. All right, we come now to the Richikar. Here's the Netherlands Bach Society here, and we'll listen to just a bit of this before I'll take any questions. Musical offering. cadence, a moment of repose. There is perhaps no ensemble in the world that is more fastidious, more detailed when it comes to period authenticity. And once again, you can't help but be thunderstruck by the Netherlands Bach Society. Did anyone notice what kind of instrument the performer is playing on here? It looks like a harpsichord, but this is not the distinctive double manual harpsichord of the Baroque period. This is a mid-18th century early piano fort replica. Well, Think about that layer of detail. The black key is reversed. Yes, the color scheme is reversed. And that really was, was the case for harpsichords. And made, that was uh, the case with pianos well into the 18th century. In fact, it's really not until Erard and Andreas Stein in the 19th century that you're going to see that start to reverse. And it's not really until Chopin and Liszt in the 1830s and 40s that the piano starts to resemble the modern, for example, baby grand that you see in this room. <clears throat> Instrument aside, there is a quiet and understated difficulty to box keyboard music. If you compare this to, say, the third movement of the Moonlight Sonata, and you ask the average person, which one sounds harder to you? Now, oh, the Moonlight Sonata is way harder, but it's not. This kind of music is so delicate, it is so exposed, and if you make one mess, there's no sustained pedal to cover it up. <laughs> Everything is bare and vulnerable. 
and everything is so interlocked in this crystalline web of counterpoint that if one voice goes awry, then the whole thing tends to collapse. So it's very, very difficult music, even though you wouldn't intuit that necessarily from listening to it. But if you looked at the score, you'd pick it up very quickly. Um, okay, let's put a, tie a nice ribbon around this idea of musical perfection. Bach understood that his music had fallen from favor. He understood that the tide was turning, just as, for example, Henry VIII understood on his deathbed in January of 1547 that Catholicism, he considered himself a Catholic, by the way, even after all the reforms of the 1530s and 40s, he, he knew that Catholicism in England was not long for the court. He knew that his brother-in-law, Jane Seymour's brother, the Earl of Hartford, was going to come in and rule a regency, and that they would be Protestants. And he knew that, and he had sort of reconciled himself to it. He didn't fight it. We get the impression that Bach felt the same way about music. He knew that music was heading in a new direction, a different direction, the sort of direction that you could find, for example, in the works of Pergolesi, or in Stamitz and Wagenstein and San Martini. Simple music, triadic music, Alberti bass lines, a dearth of counterpoint. He knew this, he understood this, he was not blind to it. And yet his response to it was to double down. Die Kunst der Fuge, the art of the fugue, the Goldberg variations, the B minor mass, all suffused with counterpoint, fugal music, which he felt was music of the castle of heaven. And of course, musical offering, Opfer, an offering. Also, as we said in, in German, it can be rendered as a sacrifice. This, perhaps, might be viewed as Bach's bequest to posterity. When you think of me, think of this. This is where I stood. This was my conviction, as far as music goes. This is the way I serve my master, and my master is not the hedonistic, temporal master of worldly pleasure, but rather the one up there. And I'll tell you this, if you look ahead, and we are looking ahead because we have two more programs in this series, almost every composer who came after Bach, maybe they didn't write a lot of fugues, maybe they didn't write much at all, but what you'll find is at the end of their lives, they're all writing fugal music. I'll give you some examples. Mozart, 1791, writes his Requiem, opens with a massive fugue, and it's not the only contrapuntal piece in the Requiem. Beethoven, towards the end of his life, if you look at a number of examples, look at the Misa Solemnis, which is this huge setting of the Mass Ordinary, over an hour and 20 minutes long in most performances. Very contrapuntal, especially in the Credo movement. Beethoven in the Ninth Symphony. Freude schöner Götter von den Tochter aus Elysium, sung in a massive double fugue towards the, 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 the middle climax of the fourth group. And Zeid und Schlung in Millionen is one voice, Another voice in 6 8 Babylon, Freude schön, der Gütter Funken, Tochter aus Elysium. So, Beethoven, Brahms in his Requiem, fugues. Brahms in his Fourth Symphony ends with a Passacaglia, a form from the Baroque period. So, even though the fugue was going out of fashion, even though Bach's pursuit of musical perfection, as he perceived it, may not have been aligned with European ears at the time, posterity would prove that he was indeed onto something that would remain compelling and tantalizing for listeners for centuries to come. And I hope that you will come back <laughs> to the Mark Twain Library in April when we talk about Mozart. Thank you, everybody.